Good afternoon to those on the East Coast, and good morning to those in the Central Time Zone and on the West Coast. To those of you who are there from Israel, from Europe, and other parts, we want to wish you a good evening. We are blessed today. My partner, Larry Krinsky, and myself, we have the great chance of interviewing Colonel Elad Edry. Now, Colonel Edry is really no stranger. In fact, he's part of the FIDF family. He's a man of incredible substance, a man who's done not only things for Israel and the, and the Jewish people in the Israeli world, but he's renowned across the world. Many of you have participated in briefings with Colonel Edry when he led a team into Turkey and saved lives. No other country saved more than one to two lives. Colonel Edry and his team saved 19 lives and treated hundreds and hundreds of wounded. It was in Surfside in Florida that it was Colonel Edry and his team that brought a sense of consolation, of comfort to the large number of Jews who lost their lives in the destruction at Surfside. Colonel Edry's been all over the world, what we call a Kiddush Hashem, a real sanctification of God's name representing Israel. Colonel Edry has trained thousands and thousands of young men and women in the Pikud Oref. There's a specific branch of Pikud Oref that's known as Search and Rescue. What is Pikud Oref, the Home Front Command? We don't have that in America, in our armed forces. We do have National Guard. We have Homeland Security. There are a number of things that we have, but there's nothing like Pikud Oref. If God forbid, let's say that there were to be a Hezbollah war, and let's say that tens of thousands of rockets would rain down upon Israel, who would be in charge of transportation when the highway system is gone, of electricity, of water, when they take out the electric grid, of taking care, creating field hospitals, if hospitals were hit? All of that is under Colonel Edry. All of that is under the Home Front Command and particularly his division, Search and Rescue, which plays not only such a crucial role in places like Haiti, in places like Turkey, in places like Japan, but if, God forbid, there were a crisis in Israel, it would be he and his team that would be leading the nation. He's a man of incredible substance. He's a man who's a friend to FIDF. It's the Wolf family, the Stearns, the Bricks of Long Island, who on his very base that's just been built, that houses thousands of soldiers, they dedicated the synagogue. It's the Goldstein family and the Baylor family who've dedicated many of the facilities there. Each of these families chose the Home Front Command because of their respect and their admiration for Colonel Edry. Colonel, thank you for joining Lara and myself. Thank you for being a friend to FIDF. And it's an incredible opportunity to have you to address an aspect of this war that we've never had addressed before. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Good evening from Israel. Um, this is a uh, Monday, a Sunday evening here. Um, almost uh, five months already of uh, this war. And um, uh, when I was asked if I can come and be part of this meeting and to debrief this uh, honorable uh, um, audience of the FIDF members and FIDF uh, uh, staff, I saw it as a great honor to be part of it. And uh, for a few times in, in the past, I had the opportunity to meet you all. And for now, I would like to share my screen and to uh, share my, um, let's say, limited experience from the beginning of the war. I chose to speak with you about the Battle of Zikim, which was uh, a very meaningful uh, battle that I uh, had uh, the chance to be part of uh, during uh, the uh, uh, opening of the war. But Colonel Edry, we... is yes, Zikim, uh, is that east of Gaza? Is that north of Gaza? Where geographically is Zikim? Zikim is, Zikim is a... Uh, is the name of three different uh, zones. I'll show you later in the map. It's uh, a nickname for a beach, for a kibbutz, and, and for my base. It's between Ashkelon and the northern border of the of the Gaza Strip. And uh, this is the place where exactly all of us uh, trained the uh, new recruits to the uh, Home Front Command uh, Search and Rescue Brigade. So Zikim is the basic training of the Home Front Command uh, Search and Rescue Brigade. To Zikim, the new recruits comes when they uh, join the, the IDF. 
And this is the place where we found myself, I found myself, and we found ourselves uh, fighting at the morning of Simchat Torah at uh, October uh, 7th. To start uh, with my uh, personal experience, I, uh, I would say that uh, I was at home. My house is uh, north, into, uh, north into Tel Aviv in Kfayona, something like 30 minutes uh, north into Tel Aviv. And at 6.30, it started with a uh, uh, ringing of the Home Front Command uh, application that signals for, for alerts. And uh, at first, I thought it's, it's an error because it's Simchat Torah morning. No way that there are missiles in, in Israel. But only after a few minutes, I understood that it's not a, it's not a mistake. During this time in Zikim, I had uh, uh, one company out of eight. Usually, we have uh, eight companies. But... Most of them were in the vacation for the holiday, so they were at home. And on this morning, we had a, a company of um, something like 120 uh, uh, new uh, recruits. Uh, only 22 of them are commanders with minimal ex experience. Uh, only one of them, the company commander, was uh, experienced uh, under fire. So we have a very young platoon commanders and squad commanders, sergeants and, and second lieutenants, all of them are very young. They only finished their training something like two months ago, and they managed to get to this role and to uh, accept the new recruits. And these new soldiers are only two months in the army, uh, very young, uh, unexperienced fully. And uh, actually, to explain what does it mean the brigade, for those who are not familiar with us. So the brigade is a very young brigade. Most of the brigades in, in the IDF are uh, or were established back in 48 with the establishment of the IDF. But the search and rescue brigade is extremely young, we can say. It's only uh, 11 years old. It was established in 2013. And it has um, eight different units, as uh, you can see here. We have four operational uh, battalions, those who you can see on the bottom. Uh, by the way, all of them are named uh, on uh, expressions from the, from the Bible. Ram, Shachar, Tavor, and Kedem. All of them are uh, leaded by uh, lieutenant uh, colonels, uh, very young uh, and brave commanders. And uh, we have two training units, which are the top and the right uh, symbols that uh, you can see which uh, one of them is the basic training unit and the other is the advanced training unit. Meaning that in Zikim, I have two uh, units, uh, something like uh, 1,200 uh, soldiers on, on a daily basis, on, on routine. But this is the weekend, weekend of the holiday, so most of them are at home. And uh, on the day of the battle, as I said, I had only one company of 120 um soldiers and, and commanders in this, in this base. So the map on this day of the battle was that I'm here at Kfariona, which is my home. In, this is the center of Israel. You can see Tel Aviv. Zikim is in the northern border of uh, the Gaza Strip, south into Ashkelon, and very, very close to Sderot and Tivot, which are very, very famous uh, cities or towns that used to uh, get hit by a lot of missiles in every operation for the past 25 years. You can see here Jerusalem and the West Bank, but you can understand the distance before b between my home to Zikim. So if it started at 6.30, it means that by 7 or 7.15, I understood that there is a, a serious uh, thing in Zikim. Usually we don't have missiles on Zikim. Usually the missiles are passing Zikim, going to uh, Ashkelon, to Ashdod, maybe to uh, Tel Aviv, or even north into that, but not in Zikim. And at the first uh, 45, 60 minutes, I got a lot of uh, a lot of uh, notifications from my staff there that uh, there are shells and, and missiles that actually. Uh, bombing the, the base and I understood that there is a serious battle there. I didn't understand at the first hour that there is also a ground battle. 
with terrorists that cross the border from the sea and from the fence from the border but uh, after an hour I, we understood that there is a, a massive attack of all the uh, part of the the western Negev and also the settlements around the Gaza Strip uh, we didn't understand the magnitude it took a few hours that we we the, the senior commanders understand that there is uh, a massive offensive all over the strip but we indeed understood that there is uh, also a ground offensive so i started um getting out of my house um my driver is also a, a young soldier he lived in Natania. it's very close to fayona i called him i told him that i'm coming and to take him and that we are uh, about to go to to ramle ramle is the headquarters where my uh, uh, uh most of the staff of the, of the brigade of the headquarters of the brigade are stationed so i plan to come here to take my uh, my gun my equipment my jeep and to get to zikim as soon as possible to participate in the battle during my drive from uh, kfariona again it's here to zikim on the morning of of the holiday of simchat torah i got a few calls from my my battalion commanders all of them were stationed in the judah and samaria different strongholds and they told me that they are starting also uh, mobilized from the west bank to the gaza strip to get to zikim and to help me the most incredible uh, phone call was from the commander of zikim base which lives here in sderot and listen to this amazing story a week ago i mean a week before the battle he um he had a, a new baby born um uh, a new son which is only seven days old on the day of the battle so his wife with his newborn baby were at her uh, in-laws house and he was with his two uh, young kids four and six that's it um in his house in the road so when i just got out of my home and i called him and i told him come to the king we'll meet there and we'll fight he told me i'm opening the window and i can count 16 terrorists with ak-47s under my house in trucks and i understood that if he uh, walks out of his house he will be slaughtered as simple as that and i told him i command you to stay at home and i'll get there by myself uh, which i did and another bat battalion commander which lives in abu snan abu snan is almost in the israel northern border next to naria he also uh, was at a uh, weekend vacation for the holiday and the both of us started to drive really fast from our homes to zikim and when we understood that the commander of the zikim base can uh, come and we understand that there are a lot of barricades between uh, Be'er Sheva and uh, Zikim. Um, we understood that only from the north we can get there because the other uh, roads were blocked. And um, we hit the road, and I'm to talking about 130 miles per hour, driving like crazy from the northern uh, part of Israel to, to Zikim. Once we got there, we understood that the battle is in three different uh, locations. First one is from the border. This is the border between Israel and the Gaza Strip. The second is from the beach. And the third is from the east side of the base because the uh, terrorists came from three different places. Around Zikim, what we call Zikim, we have the kibbutz here. We have the base and we have the beach. So all around the parameter of Zikim, there were more than 100 terrorists that came in four different ways and started moving to three different places. The Erez stronghold, the Iftah stronghold, and my base. Now, if you can look at Erez and Iftah, you can see that there, there are very small strongholds and Zikim is a huge base. And on Zikim, defending only 120 uh, soldiers, which as I mentioned, almost 90 of them are new recruits with no experience and no sense of 
getting into battle, and the rest of them, the commanders, are also very young and inexperienced. What actually happened in Zikim? This is the road from Zikim the kibbutz to Zikim the base, the one that I just draw now with the arrow. This is the road to Zikim the beach. And this is our main training zone. Lara, if you recall, we were there together. We took pictures. Lara I came to visit that. us. Yes. And uh, when I came from the road, it was almost 9 a.m. The battle started at 7.30. The commanders of the base were in five different posts. The main gate, the sea gate, because the beach is here, the shooting range gate, and post Vav. Vav means in Hebrew F. The rest of the, the company was here. In these blocks, these blocks are used to sleep. And the rest of the base is actually uh, empty. So I came from the road and I was without nothing. I wasn't, I, I came straight from home. Once I understood that there is a ground battle on Zikim, I skipped off uh, Ramle. I didn't take my gear, my, my weapon, my Jeep. I just came with my uh, original car and um, I was without nothing, only the uniform to my body. Then we got to this road. On this road, I was amazed, overwhelmed, overwhelmed to, to see vehicles, uh, civilian vehicles, obviously, that came from the beach. Once the, the terrorists uh, landed on the beach, the civilians uh, tried to escape to this road. And here also terrorists waited and ambushed them and actually slaughtered them. So I saw a few vehicles including one, one, military, one military vehicle um, just on the shoulders of the road. And I saw a lot of bodies on the road. I didn't understand what I see at first because obviously it wasn't a, a car accident, even not a mass car accident. Obviously it was an ambush. And for a second there, I actually waited to get also shot by someone from one of these bushes. If you can see, there are a lot of bushes from the both sides of the of the road. This is the road, and we can see a lot of bushes. Okay. And um, actually, what happened that I passed this road? I don't know how. Nobody shot me. I don't have explanation until today. And then I got to the main gate. On the main gate, there were a few soldiers, very frightened. They almost shot me themselves because they didn't understand who I am. The young soldiers don't know who is the brigade commander. But one of the squad commanders that was also posted in, on this gate saw that it's me and he opened the gate. And then uh, when he opened the gate, I got inside to the, to the entrance of the base. And on this second, actually, the battle on Zikim for me started. It started that I got to understand what happened from one of the officers that was there also. And 10 minutes later, two more majors that came from the center of Israel, from Rishon LeZion, uh, joined me. And together we were uh, a very uh, little or uh, a small team. And we started to advance from the main gate to the shooting range gate. And for us, uh, the way we understood the situation inside the base, the base is all full with, with terrorists. We didn't know uh, where are they because the base is very, very big. So we started to scan it and we first got to the mail safe room. It's a place where the uh, commanders actually uh, put all the, all the soldiers that weren't experienced in order to, to save them. And in this uh, safe room, I was very uh, surprised to, to meet a rabbi. And you may ask, what, what the hell a rabbi is supposed to do in a military base in the middle of a battle? And I asked him the same question. I told him, what are you doing here, rabbi? And he told me, I came to be with my family uh, um, to celebrate the holiday with the soldiers, to help them with the service, to help them with the 
with the holiday uh, meal and and we're here and uh, i told him okay how many how many of your family members are here and he told me my wife and all my eight children and his wife was a nurse she is still a nurse the rebetzin and she helped at the first uh, shooting at the beginning of the battle she tried to help one of the sergeants that was was injured and she was injured also herself by the bullets of the terrorists so she was shot she got shot in three different spots in her uh, in her belly and uh, she was uh, very uh, severe wounded so i have a family of 10 civilians in the middle of a battlefield in the middle of a base that is attacked and i saw a lot of something like 80 uh, young soldiers, very frightened. Some of them were crying. Some of them were, were wiping. Some of them were in shock. And I don't see any commander. And then it was the first time that someone told me that the commanders actually are at the post. It means that the company commander, in a very, very brave and very uh, intelligent decision, decided on the beginning of the battle that all the commanders will go to the posts. They will replace the young soldiers, the uh, unexperienced soldiers. And then they locked, I can say that, they locked the young unexperienced soldiers in two different safe rooms. We have safe rooms from, for male and female. So in this place where it's written male safe room, we have in two different rooms something like 80 to eight, 80 to 90 uh, new recruits. We have the family of the rabbi. And then I discovered that on the Seagate, we also have 20 civilians that managed to uh, save from the beach because on the beach there was a, a big party, not like the, the festival, I believe all of you heard at Nova. It's, it's, it was a small party of 50 people, more or less. The first uh, terrorists that landed on the beach, they slaughtered something like 20, 25 terrorists, and the rest of them managed to run to the Seagate. So I have also 20 civilians in the Seagate, uh, guarded by only one commander. I have four commanders in the shooting range gate and six commander in, uh, commanders in, in Bab Post. These young soldiers, young squad commanders, young platoon commanders, they saved the day because they were fought with the terrorists for almost an hour and a half before I just came there. And they uh, managed to uh, defend the base. They managed to avoid from the terrorists to uh, get inside the base. Only one terrorist managed to get inside. It was the one that shot the rabbi's uh, wife, the Rebetzin, and managed to kill another one, a new recruit. But then the soldiers killed him in immediately. So during the scanning of the base, I found uh, eventually seven uh, dead soldiers uh, from this company. The company commander, his deputy, two platoon commanders, one squad, squad commander, the driver of the company, and one new recruit. Uh, beside them, we had 10 uh, commanders and, and soldiers that were injured from the many fire and many shots that the terrorists shot at them from the different directions of the base. Uh, the base actually was attacked from four different directions. And when I got there with a few of my uh, officers uh, that came from home with me, we managed to kill the rest of the terrorists that were uh, surrounding the base. We managed to um, take care of the wounded and we managed to save them. We have so many stories about Zikim, and uh, I can't tell all of them. So out of dozens of stories, I picked this one. I'll tell you what you see in this, uh, in this picture. Um, during the evacuation of the wounded that was under heavy fire of missiles and shots and, and shells and you name it, um, to the main gate of the base came a civilian, a volunteer, very brave from Zikim the Kibbutz. And he put his truck and he told me, if you have wounded, I can take them. So I took two uh, wounded uh, uh, commanders from the battle and I put them on the truck. And as you can see from the picture, you can't close the back door of the truck. So it was an extreme danger that the 
uh, stretchers will fall down from the truck while it's uh, uh, driving back to Ashkelon, where we have the closest uh, hospital called the uh, Brazilite. So I picked two soldiers, very brave. You can see them in the picture. I told them, jump on the truck with your left hand. Just put it on the truck and, and hold yourself. When with your right hand, you need to hold the, the wounded. You need to hold the stretcher and to avoid it from falling down to the floor. Because if it will happen during the driving, of course, they will die. And these two very brave uh, soldiers uh, escorted the, the wounded, by, by the way, without weapons. So if they would, would have ambushed, they would have also killed on the way. It was a very dangerous road. And on the right uh, part of the picture, you can see a, a, a red circle. The red circle is Noah Zevi. Noah Zevi is one of the very famous uh, stories from the Zikim battle. She was shot in her left eye, and the bullet penetrated the brain and blowed her, uh, her skull. On the first uh, time when I saw her uh, lying in one of the barracks in, in the company uh, uh, blocks, I thought she is dead. After something like 40 minutes, one of my officers noticed that she is alive, and we decided to, to take her with this truck. And believe me, I didn't see for my whole life as a commander. I'm 25 years serving at the IDF, and I didn't see in my life someone that is getting shot in, in their head, and they managed to survive. So she was shot in her head, and her skull was blown, and um, she survived this drive. She got to the hospital from Barzilla in Ashkelon. They took her to uh, Jerusalem, to a special... Uh, uh, surgery that uh, she needed to have in her head. And today we have Noah alive. On the left uh, picture, you can see Noah before the, the battle. On the right, uh, uh, during the process of recovery. And uh, the happy uh, part of it is that uh, last week uh, she had a very complicated uh, surgery that uh, uh, actually completed her head with a special part that was printed from a, a special polymer in, in Switzerland. And she is walking and talking and fully functioning, a kind of a miracle. And it's only wow. one out of a few dozens of story from this battle, because on this battle, four different uh, commanders got shot in their head. All of them survived. The Rebetsen survived. And uh, we managed to uh, take out all the wounded and uh, to give them a a good treatment that saved their lives. Um, these are the seven uh, dead uh, soldiers and officers from uh, this battle. Um, Adil is the is the commander of on the left. The left picture is Adil. Adil Abudi uh, is the is the company commander. On his right, it's uh, Or Moses, his his deputy. Here you see in the center of the picture, the two platoon commanders, uh, both of them died together in the same post from uh, an RPG rocket, which is an anti-tank rocket. Here on the right and up uh, picture, we can see Omri Niv Feierstein, which is the, the driver of the company. On the right side from uh, the bottom, we can see Neria, uh, which was the only recruit that uh, was uh, killed in, in this battle. And on the left and the bottom uh, picture, we can see uh, Eden Alon Levy, which was the squad commander that was died. All seven of them were part of very heroism battle that managed to uh, prevent the, the terrorists to get inside Zikim. To the other strongholds ar around Zikim, also uh, a lot of terrorists uh, came and attacked, and we had a few dozens of uh, of uh, young soldiers that uh, were died during the, these battles. And all around the Kim, we had uh, a lot of casualties, unfortunately. Uh, we used to say in the IDF that we failed on the morning of the October 7th because we didn't keep uh, on our mission to defend the uh, Israeli society. We failed, we admitted. But very, very soon after we got uh, surprised by this uh, mega offensive of Hamas, we managed to uh, attack back 
And this uh, offensive of the IDF is uh, still uh, ongoing inside the Strip. And uh, we are very proud of uh, what we do uh, even uh, today. On uh, January, this is the last slide, and then we can have some questions, uh, obviously. Um, on January 22, uh, we uh, finished with the certain mission. All the brigade uh, battalions, all the warriors uh, went out of the Gaza Strip after 40, after 74 days of uh, battles and, and fighting in a, almost in a row. And I brought them to Latrun. This is Latrun. It's a, it's a very, uh, um, very famous site next to Jerusalem in, in the center of Israel uh, with, with a special story of itself. But we brought them to Latrun and we had a, a big, big, big ceremony to um, announce that we finished with the Gaza Strip mission. Now we are at Judah and Samaria preparing to the north. This is something that we'll talk in another time. And um, we fought for 74 days inside the Strip. We did hundreds of different missions. Lucky us, we didn't have any more casualties, no wounded, no dead inside these battles in the Strip. You can see uh, thousands of orange braids in this picture. You are actually observing now uh, almost uh, 2,500 soldiers. Most of the warriors is a salute to these uh, young, uh, uh, brave women and men that fought inside the Gaza Strip. And uh, Lara, I'm with you for your questions. Oh, Colonel Edry, you are so extraordinary, so remarkable. Your soldiers just, they just are unbelievable. They're unbelievable. And our hearts are with you and with all of them. And we're so, so grateful for everything that they have done to secure our all of our homes, our home Israel. Um, you know, it's so crazy to think, you know, the reference that Colonel Edry made while during his speech was that we had a chance to meet at the Zakim base this summer, um, just in August the Zakim army base where all of this happened. And it's so wild to think that that place where we stood and we talked to these young soldiers and we got to know them and we had lunch with them in a lunchroom that turned into a battle zone, Colonel Edry was telling me. It's crazy to think about, like for the viewers at home, when you first go into the Z Zakim base, I was so touched to see that you go into a grove of olive trees, that they have they had a grove of olive trees there, these, this symbol of peace that they understood that ultimately Israel wants peace. And that that is the first thing that these recruits who come to train see. I was so moved by it. And then to see that this place was attacked so ruthlessly, like my imagination was just going wild once I understood what was happening at that very place with those young soldiers and wondering what happened to those soldiers that we spoke to? What happened to them? And that's my first question, Colonel Edry. One of the things I've learned after working with the soldiers for so many years is how the commanders really view every soldier as their as their child, as their children, as their responsibility. What was going through your head when you were racing at 130 miles down the freeway without even a bulletproof vest yourself, without even a weapon yourself? What were you thinking about knowing that those recruits weren't prepared for what they were facing? With what could you what on a human level, I'm just wondering, you know, what was going through your mind? Well, it was a, a great mix of, of emotions. It was fear, to admit. It was determination. It was uh, a fully understanding that I'm going inside a bottle, so it's going to be extremely rough. And I understood some way around Ashkelon that I'm actually going inside the battle without a weapon. And uh, all I had in my head that was that uh, I need to be with my soldiers in the front and there is no way that I will let them fight and I'll left behind. And as an example for what I'm saying just right now, on this day, three brigade uh, commanders, uh, colleagues of mine died during uh, the battles fighting with their soldiers just like me. Some of them just came from home, from the holiday, just like me. And in the IDF, we believe that the commanders always need to be in the front uh, and 
defend their soldiers while fighting the, the terrorists. Yeah, wow, it's extraordinary. I wanted to ask, are you able to share with us what happened to the commander who was in Sterot? Yeah, we send another, we have a very big brigade, so we send one of our battalion commanders to, to Sterot, and he rescued this uh, commander and his family also. He Thank managed God. to to get them out of uh, Sderot. They are now in a safe place in in uh, next to Netanya, and they are very, all of them are well. Thank you. Just to understand, there's so many pieces of the story that you told. Um, you know, I have two questions for you. Um, from once the once your the the search and rescue brigade, uh, you know, sort of got that situation at Zikim under control. Can you share with us? Um, maybe three questions if we have time for it. What was the um, what was the unit's role? you know, in those days in, in Israel, where there were all of these bodies to identify and these horrible situations where people still needed to be rescued. Can you share with us, what was your team doing during that time? The battle of Zikim ended by, uh, exactly by uh, 2.15 p.m. I called the general, the Home Front Command General, and I told him that we killed all the terrorists, we evacuated all the wounded and the dead. And we thought for a few minutes that it was the end of the day and it was only the beginning. Um, my units went to help uh, to assist all the near settlements, the Rot and the Ofakim and a few Kibbutzim. The most famous one is Beiri. We took uh, part of uh, evacuation Beiri under heavy, heavy fire, under uh, a threat of of getting shot from any point in any uh, house in, in uh, Beiri because there were dozens of terrorists inside the Beiri and, and Kfaraza and others. And meanwhile, we got uh, orders to evacuate something like 30 different uh, settlements around the Gaza Strip and 50 other settlements in the northern border. And we did it in, uh, in several days. And I think that the five first days were like one very, very long day for us because we rescued and we evacuated and we uh, went from south to, to north and, and backwards and uh, all the search and rescue brigade took a huge uh, effort in order to uh, save all these uh, citizens because uh, the idea of first mission is to defend the people of Israel. That's it. And that's what we did for the first five days. And then we started to prepare the, the offensive. So there's two incredible stories I'd love for you to share with us. Um, I mean, there's so many, but since we don't have unlimited time, um, one of the stories is uh, to share with us about the Shahar Battalion um, that has female battalion a female com battalion commander who led her team into Gaza. Um, and it, it's one of these incredible stories about men and women fighting shoulder to shoulder in a, in a co-ed unit. And I'd love for our audience to get to hear about the Shahar Battalion. Um, and then also, if you can then tell us about the famous, um, unfortunately, the, the, the famous building collapse in Gaza where 21 soldiers were killed. And if you can share with us how the search and rescue brigade helped in that situation. Um, I know that uh, in the Israeli media, uh, Shahar Battalion is mentioned many times, but uh, it's not only Shahar. All the four uh, uh, battalions are mixed, male and female, equally uh, serving. All four battalions fought inside the strip. Uh, Shahar is led by a female. This is why it's uh, a bit unique, but all of them are mixed female and male. We have company commanders, female. Uh, uh, for example, in the uh, Tavo Battalion, uh, it was the only battalion that went to Khan Yunis, which is, uh, if we can say that, even more dangerous than the city of Gaza. So uh, in all four uh, battalions, uh, female officers were in the refugee camps inside the Strip, leading the, the soldiers, uh, fighting, uh, firing, locating tunnels, locating uh, missile rockets and, and launchers, and destroy them, of course. Uh, as I said, for 74 days. 
And uh, it was unbelievable to see uh, hundreds, not dozens, hundreds of, of uh, soldiers, uh, let's say for, between 40 to 50 percent of them female, fighting is the same as, uh, as male. And when we got to this uh, big ceremony I showed you uh, on uh, Latoon, when I uh, went up to, to speech, when I spoke with, uh, with the brigade, I told them that there is no more dispute or discussion or, or uh, public uh, uh, discussion about uh, the ability of female to fight uh, behind the borders, behind the, the enemy lines. So this is the first uh, answer. The second uh, one about uh, the demolition, the search and rescue operation, it's so long, it's so wide. I uh, can only suggest that we will keep it to, to another session because we can talk it, uh, we can talk about it a whole day because it was extremely, even more extreme than the Battle of Zikin. Wow. Wow. That says a lot. Um... So maybe we'll, you know, there's your teaser, everybody. Keep watching for the next time Colonel Edry comes on. We'll, we'll get into that, that massive story. But one of the things that, you, that we can talk about is, you know, the Search and Rescue Brigade, they have been going in, even helping to try and find uh, remnants of where the hostages may have been. Is that right? Like, um, what has the role been in sort of the, in the, search and rescue, like how did, with the DNA and the different search, can you sort of shed some light into that? I would need to apologize and say that uh, I can't refer to this topic. Oh. What we do referring to the hostages. Okay, okay. So, excuse me, we'll, we'll scratch that. It's okay. The last question, since we're, we're sadly at the end of our time together, is, is just a, another human question. Um, you have a family of your own and you risk it all you've been risking it all day after day week after week now month after month um and i just wanted to ask how does your family handle knowing that you are in the most dangerous places in the world right now and facing these ruthless barbaric enemies face to face like how are they coping i i mean how are you coping but how also are they coping you know these little kids knowing what their Abba is doing. How How is everyone doing? Well, to be honest, I uh, kept them in the dark most of the days of the war, including the, the opening day. Um, my 14 and a half years old son, Omer, well, he's trained from the mission to, to Surfside and then the mission to Turkey and now the war. So um, the only thing I used to see to stay or to do is to send them from time to time a picture and, and to write down that I'm okay. And by the way, when we get inside the strip, we do it without our cell phones and we have a special uh, red phones, which are uh, top secret phones. And, and I called friends that are in the base and I told them to call my parents and my son and to tell them that I'm okay. And um, I did it on a daily basis. So they will have a, a minor uh, understanding of, where I am and what I'm doing, but I didn't say what I do. And uh, in a few uh, ironic cases, they saw it from the uh, Israeli media. Uh, but uh, I think that the situation in Israel is that in every house, you know someone that is inside the strip, is in the northern border, is risking his life in some way. So the uh, atmosphere here is of a uh, great pride and a great uh, resilience because we know that it's for a very good cause we know that we came here to win this war whatever it takes and we are willing to do it for many many months from now uh, including the northern uh, enemy we have the uh, hezbollah so uh, there is nothing to worry about uh, for the resilience and the and the ability of the idea believe me amazing you know, everyone on this call is a supporter of the IDF. We, you know, we are so grateful to you. You know, your your unit especially just speaks to our hearts. You know, Steve mentioned the names of some families at the beginning of this call who especially have wanted to bring Zikim back, you know, better than before. Um, and, and that's just representative of all of us. You know, you are just 
the salt of the earth. You thank God that we have you. And we just love you so much. We're so grateful for your leadership. We're so grateful for you and your soldiers and your bravery, your courage, your ethics, your ability to handle this incredible stress, this unbelievable, the stakes being so enormous and to perform at such a peak level within all of that. It's just extraordinary. We can't imagine. And we're just so grateful that to be your friend, to be a friend of the IDF, to be a friend. Um, and to do whatever before, before we be, before you. we say goodbye i would like to to add that uh, for the the period of the war for all the days of the war we felt very good uh, the support of the jewish communities from all around the world but especially from the fidf uh, the israeli chapter sent a lot of his uh, members to visit us before even we got to uh, get inside and start the offensive on the Gaza Strip soil. And they met the soldiers. I remember, uh, I remember a, a, a talk that I had with one of them and uh, he was uh, pretty, <laughs> pretty scared and told me, how can you go and manage it? I mean, the strip with all the underground tunnels and all the missiles they have and the anti-tanks uh, missiles. And I told him, on, on, all you have to do is to come and to meet the soldiers in our uh, training bases where we prepare before uh, getting inside the offensive. And, and they came. They brought us a lot of uh, food, obviously, we're Jews, and they brought us uh, presents and uh, bags with uh, all kinds of, of candies and, and stuff. It, it was very heartwarming. And uh, I think that they got this special spirit of the IDF and I invite you all, uh, FIDF members, to visit Israel. Most of it's safe now, by the way. To meet the soldiers, even in my brigade base, and to get the Israeli spirit and these in these special days uh, from uh, us directly. Thank you so much. I hope everybody listens to Colonel Edry. That's your mission. Head to Israel. <laughs> Go and meet with our soldiers. Infuse them with your love and appreciation. Let them feel our support and our gratitude, our endless gratitude. We are forever in their debt for what they are doing. Colonel Edry, the patches that you gave me from your helmet, I have them here. I carry them with me everywhere, legit. They are in my purse. It's my way of having the soldiers in my heart and with me everywhere I go. Thank you so much. And thank you for being with us. We love You're you. You're welcome. Love you too, goodbye. Bye. Friends. These are the incredible, incredible soldiers, the selfless soldiers that we are supporting every day. Stick with us. We will take you there. We will ensure that our soldiers have everything that they need to win this war. Our soldiers cannot turn the channel. They cannot take a break. The war continues, even if the media cycle has moved on. Our soldiers are fighting. I've been told that it's akin to performing um, open heart surgery 24 hours a day, day after day, week after week. That is the precision that our soldiers are using in this battle. And we, as Colonel Edry alluded to, know that this is a multi-front war. So we need to stay focused. We need to stay with them. Stay with us. We will, united, we will win this war. Am Yisrael Chai, forever. <laughs>